Okay. Well, I would like to thank John and the library for having me. Should I be looking at the general description? Uh, you can just look at you can just look <laughs> in general. Okay. <laughs> Star stare off into the distance. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know the the weather changed things. I was saying to my girlfriend Lily on the way up that one of the dirty secrets of park rangers is that we like weather like that. Is people stay away. <laughs> <laughs> they stay indoors where they belong. No. <laughs> Uh, we like it until we have to go up after people in that weather, which is not the most fun. Um, anyway, this is me. This is the book. This is why we're all here. Um, just a quick little bit about me. Um, I worked for 12 years in the publishing world. I was at Maine Times for a year, and then I went to Down East for almost a decade and I was managing editor and I found that I was managing more than I was writing and I didn't grow up wanting to be a manager, I grew up wanting to be a writer. So at a certain point I decided that I had to jump and I, where I jumped to was Baxter Park. I had, I've always been a big fan, I think the first time I visited I was 10 years old, first time I climbed the mountain I was 10 years old and I always was smitten with this gift that Percival Baxter gave the people of the state of Maine. Um, so for the past 20 years, I have split my time between, from May to October, I'm in the woods, and uh, 12 months of the year, I am a, a writer. Uh, I still, that's how I make my living, really. This is because I, I love to be a park ranger, and I get benefits. Um, but other than that, I, I mostly make, earn my living as a writer. So 12 months as a writer, six months as a ranger, and that means 18 months is a long year. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, we will uh, hop along here. So most of you are familiar with Baxter Park. I mean, when, when I give this talk in other areas, people aren't as familiar with Baxter Park. It's not right on their doorstep, so to speak. But this here is the park. Um, at least this is the sort of southwest where I'm located. It's really kind of fuzzy. Looks like the uh, satellite was very hazy when I took this picture. Mm -hmm. um, kidding. Uh, so this is the, this, the south entrance of the park, right down here at Toad Pond Gate, and I am at Daisy Pond, which is right here amidst all of this water, um, and the big one is right over here. So uh, I, my duty station is very near the Todd and Stream Campground and A Ball Campground, the two west side trailheads, and so. That is why I will sometimes get sucked into rescues and um, other adventures because those are those are the places where they get the most foot traffic. Obviously, everybody comes in to, to do the mountain. Um, one of my I don't want to say regrets for other people, but I, I'm always I feel bad when people show up at you know Friday night after dark with the express intent of going up to Todd and they do that and they leave because just. Quite aside from from all these ponds, you know, up at South Branch and Russell Pond and over at Todd and Lake. I mean, we have just beautiful, beautiful country. We have dozens and dozens of other peaks and um, countless water bodies. I mean, there's so much to do that people miss out on um, with this sort of conquer Katahdin mentality. Um, so I'm not. I'm not sure how much of you folk, uh, how many of you folks know how the park was put together, but one of the things I found fascinating was how Percival Baxter knew when he purchased this land in 1931 and gave it to the state, this, this being the very first parcel and where Katahdin is, that eventually he would be able to assemble a park around it. And he was, he, his next purchase was up in this area, which just at South Branch Pond here is number two, and then number three is uh, just below it which, as you can tell, is not contiguous in any way. So he just had to have this vision, this idea that uh, I will be able to do this. I'll be able to put it all together, ultimately. Um, so you can see that it was put together in many pieces over time. And what the governor cleverly did was in each deed, he had different um, uh, stipulations so that when you add it all up, it's just it's almost impossible to... to do anything that he did not want done in Baxter Park, um, which we're, I'm very thankful for. And again, I'm right down here in this little corner um, at Daisy Pond. So this is just some of the country. You can recognize some of these landmarks. Um, 
This is looking down into Chimney Pond from the summit. Um, so just as some of the countryside, this is my personal neighborhood. Um, Double Top is one of my favorite peaks. People will often ask me, um, what do you like to do? And I'll say, I like to do Double Top because it looks out over Katahdin. So in many ways, I think the view is better because what you're seeing is like the most magnificent view of one of the most magnificent things. So I always recommend uh, Double Top heartily. And I, the thing, like Katahdin, Double Top is one of these mountains where as you drive alongside it, it widens and, and opens up. It, it up from the distance looks like a volcano, um, but it's got really neat cliff walls. It's just a, one of my favorites. And we have, you know, spectacular waterfalls like Katahdin Stream Falls. Um, we've fished, um, fished people that have fallen 20, 30 feet into Katahdin Stream Falls, leaning out to get a really good picture. It's not recommended because it, you don't land very well. Um, so this is uh, my residence for six months of the year, um, and this is double top behind it. And about where you folks are sitting is the Appalachian Trail, so I get to watch AT hikers all day long. Um, I'm glad I can't smell that far. <laughs> and this is this is my station. Um, I always joke I was saying to Lily when I was wooing her that uh, I have my name on a building. <laughs> um, very simple uh, building. These are fire backpack pumps for firefighting. Um, there's two of us. Mo at most duty stations will have two rangers. Um, my partner is Charity Lavasser. You can see there. I don't spend a whole lot of time in this building. I have office hours like a professor in the morning and the evening um, where people will know uh, they'll find a ranger in there because one of the things I like about my job that I mentioned in the book is we, unlike National Park Service rangers, we range by definition. So we, I, in the course of the day, I will very rarely be sitting at my desk. I will be off cleaning outhouses. I will be working on buildings. Last week we were roofing. Um, we deal with a lot of firewood. Um, we have what's called a uh, our normal duties and then other duties as assigned, which means we could be sent to do anything anywhere in the park. Yes? I know you cut a lot of firewood for this uh, camper so you don't cut down trees, but do you charge them for the yes. fire? Yes, yeah, we charge them. Um, $5 a bundle for your recreational fires. Mm -hmm. Hang on, there we go. So this is basically my office. This is, <laughs> um, or, oh, Daisy Pond, which is where my station is, and of course the mountain, the Owl, Barren Mountain, and we have six canoes and three kayaks that folks can rent. Um, you should see how newbies paddle. It's, it's amusing sometimes they like to sit and face each other. <laughs> they like to use kayak paddles. They like to stand. I mean, I, this, there's a lot of old-time Maine guides will stand, but these people stand in the wrong way at the wrong time. Um, we built this just about a year ago, um, so it's another thing we do is build stuff. Um, part of the th appeals of my job for me is the variety. On a given day, I don't know what, I have been called off on rescues before I even sign on in the morning, and I've been off on rescues in the evening, I've been sent to fires before I even sign on in the morning. Um, we, we build things. I responded to car accidents. I mean, I respond to car accidents. We, we do everything. Um, and that's part of what makes the job so interesting to me. So Daisy Pond is 10 cabins, rental cabins. And this is an example of one. This is right off the parking lot. You can see here, cabin. It's got two beds, obviously a wood stove um, and a gas light. And that's basically it. Otherwise, it's a tent. In, in other words, you need to bring your sleeping bags, your Dish, your, your cooking, your cookware, um, towels, everything. We, there's nothing in here other than beds to, to lay your head. Um, outhouse, woodshed. Um, one of the things that I, I like about Daisy Pond is it's great for folks that are getting tired of sleeping on the ground, and it's also great for kids because you don't want kids' first experience to be waking up in six inches of water in the bottom of a tent. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, uh, is great for keeping people warm, keeping uh, the bugs away. Um, so 
it's a good sort of soft introduction to, to camping in Baxter Park. How soon do you have to make a reservation? We have a four-month rolling reservation system, so the soonest you can is four months prior to the date mm -hmm. you want to start your vacation in. Um, this is just another example of a, another cabin right on the shore of Daisy Pond, um, another two-person cabin. You can see well lived in. This is, we have a library at Daisy Pond. I couldn't find any pictures of our library at Daisy Pond. This is the library at Kidney Pond, which is very, it's larger, but the same idea. Um, you have all kinds of historic tomes. W one year I was, uh, had the idea that I would assign myself a book a season. I mean, I read uh, many more books than that, but I, from the library, some historic tome that I have to select off the shelves because it's quite eclectic and often not very inviting. Um, we do, we've had, a, as staff, we use this building a lot because we, ha especially in the area back here, the wood stove, we do a lot of training in this building um, because it can accommodate you know, 30 of us around tables and we're still in the park. Um, we've responded to, we've had search and rescue training where we have to go on a search right from this building, from the training. Um, I, what was it, a, maybe a month and a half ago, I was in an advanced firefight, wildland firefighting training, which was kind of cool in that building. And this is the porch of the library, and you can see what some of the regulars like to do, which is sit and look at that view that you saw a moment ago. Mm. This is, if I had seen this, some, uh, someone else took this photo, not me, but this is not, this is an open container in a public place, which is not allowed. <laughs> so I, they, they would have gotten talking to. Maybe it's going to rain. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but hardcore fisherman, um, painter, so people come for all kinds of different reasons. We, we get a fair uh, number of artists, and in my particular, uh, in, at Daisy Pond, fly fishing is, it rules the day for lots of the season, um, so we get very, very serious fishermen. It's some of the best fishing in the Northeast is within five miles of Daisy Pond, mm -hmm. in, including Daisy Pond. So I mentioned training. Um, this is us at one of our many trainings. Uh, a lot of people will say, did you, go, did you get a degree to become a park ranger? No, I have a degree in English and history. Um, I, you know, how do you become a park ranger if you want to, you know, as a writer? Well, when I, when I was writing, I was also a registered name guide and I was a firefighter. Uh, structured, I mean, a town firefighter. Um, so I was familiar with rescue, um, and uh, I was a guy, I had a guy's license, which means the warden service thinks you are somewhat um, to be trusted in the woods. Um, so mostly what Baxter Park does is puts us through their own series of training modules. This is a helicopter training that we're doing with the Forest Service. Um, and I believe on this particular day we were doing a short haul training and the short hauls are kind of cool. Um, we work a lot with the Forest Service. We do a lot with helicopters. Um, I told Lily when I was trying to woo her that I flew around helicopters as well as had my name on a building. Um, we obviously we, we use helicopters for rescue and for firefighting. Um, in this case, a short haul is what we call human external cargo where a um, crewman will fly below, they'll lift off from a pit like this, and they'll fly with a crewman below the, the helicopter until they meet the patient. The, the, the helicopter will descend, gently put the, the uh, crewman down, not a medic, just a person for packaging the patient. We do the, we do the ready the patient, inter medically speaking. The bird flies off, comes back a little bit later, and the crewman has hooked up the patient into, if the patient is upright and it, it's um, appropriate, they'll be put into a screamer suit, which is a harness, screamer suit. <laughs> and then the crewman will clip in and the two will fly underneath the bird out to await an ambulance. And it's a short haul because it's not, not a far distance. They're hanging down? Hanging below, right. hanging below, human external cargo. 
<laughs> and that is why they call it the screamer suit. <laughs> okay, also, we also have what's called a Bauman bag, which is a litter, a traditional litter. Uh, traditional litter will fit inside a Bauman bag, which is, you know, a stretcher. Mm -hmm. But same same idea, flying beneath the, the, the medic, well, not the medic, but the crewman will hold on and fly with the patient to uh, a, usually one of our pits um, where, where we have wide open area and uh, be very, very gently placed on the ground. And we, during training, we always wrestle to see who gets to fly, but I have not drawn that straw yet, unfortunately. So that was one day with the Forest Service. This is another day with the Forest Service, and you can tell on this particular day, we're talking fire because this fellow is wearing Nomex, which is what we wear there. It's fire retardant. Um, so we do a lot of firefighting uh, with the, our brothers and sisters in the Forest Service. And this is another day. Here is your faithful correspondent right here um, with the National Guard and one of their awesome Blackhawks. Mm. Truly awesome. They, the, the National Guard, uh, I was explaining a little to one of, one of you folks earlier, um, they see, they use Baxter Park missions as a training mission. Um, and they will, so we don't, we don't get charged. And they, they're happy to come fly. It, before COVID, the, the thinking was always life, the patient has to be um, at risk of losing life, limb, or eyesight. That was, those were the criteria. Um, but now because of COVID, they've thrown a lot more uh, live away for us. They have a winch system, you can see here. So they don't do human external cargo. They, they drop a medic down and it's a genuine paramedic. Um, and the patient gets put into a litter and then winched up and pulled into the to bird to fly away. Because they have a medic on board, um, although I think the Forest Service is starting these days to start carrying a medic, but they didn't in the past. But because the, the guard has a medic on board, they're really great for serious, serious um, life or death situations. Um, and they can fly straight to Bangor um, with a medic on board who can stabilize the patient. Um, and they are really cool to play with. Um, we are often, uh, when, when the birds are hovering overhead, they drop lines to us, and so you feel like you have a kite, like the coolest uh -huh. kite ever. <laughs> um, How long does it take to fly to Bangor uh, from? They can get to, to uh, Millinocket in, or to Baxter Park in 25, 20, 25 minutes, oh, okay. 30 minutes. Um, so I do probably five or six rescues a year, um, maybe, maybe some years more, many years less, um, but sort of an average of five or six a year. Mm -hmm. the, my colleagues at uh, Katahdin Stream and Able Campgrounds themselves do more than that. I just, I'm usually a, not a secondary responder. Um, meaning they've already dispatched someone off the trail and they either they need more muscle to carry or I've hiked up a lot of supplies. Sometimes they'll ask for me to bring the litter up. Um, I am sometimes sent um, as the first responder, and we are, we are, m most of us, I would say, at this point in time, first, res first wilderness first responders, so we have, I think it's 80 hours of medical training. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do some form of wilderness medical training, and then we will do, a lot of us are wildland firefighters now. Um, which is a couple of different modules that we've done over the years. And we do a search and rescue course. Um, and I'm trying to think of the basics. Oh, we chainsaw training. We get certified for chainsaw usage. And those are the four that, are, that everybody must have at some point. Um, some of us go beyond, like I said, we, we've got wildland firefighters and wilderness first responders. You only have to be certified at, for Wilderness Advanced First Aid, but most of us, I would say, at this point have gone to first responder status. Um, and then oh, we've done a whole bunch of additional trainings over the years from, and we do a helo tra helicopter training every year, too, typically. Um, but then we have done everything from, um, um, 
mental health first aid, we do conflict de-escalation, we do, um, we have done death investigation, a search and seizure training. Um, so we'll do all these different modules, uh, flat, flat water rescue, fast water rescue. Um, those are not, those are all just periodically offered. They're not all uh, part of the regular training regimen, but I have, since I've been there 20 years, I've been lucky enough to do them all, and they're all a whole lot of fun. Um, especially playing with helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing cooler. I mean, there's no better sound when I, I was saying to another ranger that the way I think about it is you know, on these days where your patient is, you know, 300 pounds and it's cold or it's wet and you've been out all night long and you're exhausted, I always like to think, you know, at least we're not getting shot at because <laughs> other people who are hauling rivers are often getting shot at, especially with who these boats work with. But the greatest sound, and when you're in those circumstances to hear is the the rotors coming. You know the cavalry has arrived and you can go home and get dry and go to sleep. It seems to really like this slide. <laughs> is it just the arrow key? Or will the arrow key move it? Or? I'll turn the arrow key. I think it's crashed. Oh. The, uh, the cursor is dead, and uh, this thing is mm. dead. It's dead. We're going to have to ask first response. Yeah, we're going to have to <laughs> medevac the... This is my best slide. I'm going to restart it. Do you remember what number You had other problems in the middle of presentations, but yeah, never the entire computer froze up and not the passengers were flying. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, what happens is the crewmen will, in a short haul, will uh, drop a, a rope below them and we will help keep them out from going into the trees. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what the rope is. And then when they go back up, they drop the rope and it's got a big carabiner and you always have to remember to look for the carabiner <laughs> so you don't get it in your nose. But one of these is me and uh, this is me and this is Nick uh, McPherson. We were, patient is here. Ben Goodwin from the Forest Service. We, um, this is the A-Ball Trail. We were sent up in the middle of the night after this patient who had an unstable knee. And we, we always, in uh, Wilderness Rescue, it doesn't really matter what the injury is. It's stable or unstable. Um, meaning you can either put weight on it and walk or you can't. Uh, because, you know, what's in there, it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's broken, if it's dislocated, uh, some uh, dislocation sometimes we can um, reduce um, in the field, but for the most part, we just say stable or unstable, stable or unstable. Are we carry in or are we fly in or what are we doing? So this is a, a short haul from the uh, perspective of the aircraft. In this rescue, we went up at probably, I want to say, 11.30 at night uh, after this woman who had an unstable knee and we found her on um, sort of the top of the A-ball slide on the A-ball trail. After we found her probably about 12.30 at night. And we managed to walk her, one of us on either side of her, for two and a half miles down the mountain, which took us basically from about 12.30 to about 5.30 in the morning until she finally said, I can't go any further. And she happened to do so right in this little clearing where we could get a call for uh, an airlift. Um, so she gets airlifted and then I noticed in the description in the newspaper, Ranger Ben Goodwin <laughs> rescues patient off the able <laughs> <laughs> to Baxter Park Rangers assistant. <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben was with her for maybe 12 minutes. He did all the, <laughs> he did all the cool stuff. He you know, goes in, flies in, you know, through the air like a superhero, but we walked her for all night long. Uh, not, that we do, not that we do it for the glory. It was just, it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> two, two, I think it said something like two Baxter Park Rangers ably assisted or something like that. <laughs> so this is a, a graphic that just kind of shows you where SAR stands for search and rescue. So in th this is one particular year, you'll see there's about 39 rescues total. And the majority of them are gonna be on the east side of the mountain, which is the west side of the graphic here. Um, and my neighborhood would be, so about 35% are hunting, he, a, a ball. This is where I would tend to get sent. Usually I don't get sent to the, to the east side of the mountain, which is over in Roaring Brook where, and Chimney Pond. Um, I have done many a rescue over there, but usually um, I'm on the, on the west side, the best side. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we will do, I've done rescues in the north, I've done rescues in the, in the east, but for the most part, I'm just on this, my side of the mountain. And this just shows you the top five causes for search and rescue operations. We did a little study. Um, this shows you the, the years uh, our medical director looked at, which was 92 to 2014. And it shows you the um, why we end up going up on the mountain. And so the number one is the lower extremity injury. Number two is exhaustion, which surprised me. I would think those would have been flipped. But lower extremity, obviously, is your knees and your ankles. Um, loss party number three, a, a head injury. Four, and upper extremities, which just, again, I find some of this a little uh, unusual. I would say dehydration exhaustion would be the pretty much our number one case, but um, I'm obviously wrong. <laughs> and this is showing you SAR incidents by month. So, and this is the years 2016 to 2019. So very clearly, the bulk of SAR occurs from June to October. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, August is when the most people are there, and that's when you usually see the most. Um, July and August and September are your busiest months and everything kind of 
it's nice little peak. Um, and then we we are open for winter camping. I'm a seasonal, so I am not involved with the winter operations of the park. But you can see that um, we do get a handful of every, every February. February. Vacation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We had two real serious ones last winter. Um, and we, we have the occasional periodic fatality in the winter as well. We average about one fatality a year, um, which we've gone several years without any, but one year we had four. So, it, you know, it, but it averages out to about one per year. This is a, the, our brothers and sisters in the Forest Service, again, putting out a fire down near the Penobscot River in the southwest corner of the park along the Appalachian Trail. And this was a, this was COVID year, and we were all in training uh, doing Zoom training because we're obviously trying to protect ourselves from COVID and we didn't want to do anything indoors so we were all doing remote training and we had a visit by the head of the Forest Service who had who told us that at that point of that year they had 400 fires already so this is May mm -hmm. which was off the charts and so I, I texted one of my uh, the ranger buddies and said we're gonna have a fire this year well, a couple of hours later, all these rangers started signing off, saying, I gotta go fight a fire, I gotta go fight a fire. And unfortunately, I was back home in the mid-coast area and was not able to get there, even though I was just itching to get there. <laughs> and this was the cool stuff that you got to see on TV while, while we had to you know, sit at home and wish we were there fighting the fire. Um, but it burned about 45 acres in total, uh, which is on the big side for Baxter Park. We don't usually have the kind of fires that they see out west. Um, I have fought a handful. I got to fight one last year, but again, it was you know, under an acre. It was pretty small stuff. It was, you know, fire, but... Um, have, has Baxter changed the policy? Because years ago, they would, the philosophy was just to let it do its course and, that, and then without any intervention. Right. No, it's still that. That is still the philosophy. Um, the only we will um, try to prevent structures mm -hmm. from being burned, um, or and obviously people. Right. And, uh, this is down near Abel Bridge, mm -hmm. which is where there are people and there's campgrounds and there is um, there's a lot to protect basically. So, but it, if if it's in the if a Deep in the center of the park, looks like it will burn itself out, and there's nothing, no structures, no, they would probably let it burn. Okay. Yeah. But most of the time, I do more ordinary things like tell people where to find moose, and the answer's Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but this is me in my office, um, just chatting with some campers who have questions, handing folks maps, talking about fishing spots, and checking folks in. Um, you can see we have rescue equipment in the office. We have um, maps that we sell. We have books that we sell. Um, and I answer a lot of questions. Again, usually about moose. Can I ask you a quick question about yes. moose? With the winter ticks, are moose going to become extinct? I can't answer that, um, but they certainly, anecdotally, I mean, to the eyeball, you can, their populations couldn't they fit them with flea collars or something? <laughs> <laughs> you would have to check yeah. that up with IFNW. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tick my collars. Circus, not my monkey. <laughs> so, but most of the time I do these rather ordinary things, tell people, oh, this is, that's a rare flycatcher. Yeah. <laughs> I usually make it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, oh, like yeah. I said, most people want to know about this fellow here. Mm -hmm. Charismatic megafauna, number one. Baxter Park anyway. And wait, oh, here's another one. You guys are familiar with this species, so mm -hmm. we don't need to dwell on it. And this is me. Again, this is the opposite direction of my office. So two-way radios. Um, mm -hmm. Rangers do a lot of reports for incidents and just weekly statistics. You can see that we have an AED. We have an O2 canister. Um, what else do we have that's interesting? Narcan, all your rescue essentials. Um, yeah, and that's me late at night doing my paperwork 
probably my office hours, you can see the gas light is is on. It's kind of an unfortunate um, <laughs> <laughs> look. And okay. so, I, as I said, May to October is my season, and this is what it looks like as I prepare to leave. Mm. I usually get one or two inches of snow before I head out. Mm -hmm. This is me in my truck with it was just not four wheel drive, and it was that was a particularly nervous day because I had to go down Avall Hill, and it was slippery. Mm. And sometimes I get lucky enough to come back in the winter to do um, projects, volunteer, help other rangers, hang out with ranger buddies. Um, this is obviously on a snow sled, which is how we travel in the winter. Um, but you bring your snowshoes, you always have a saw, um, and that's your, your corresponding. On that particular trip, I got to see a family of lynx, which was oh, awesome. Nice. And it was neat because they were very obviously hunting. So you had one lynx that would run down the side of the road and three that would try to flush uh, snowshoe hairs into the road wow. so this one could pick it off. Oh and it was really, really cool. Oh. And f as re sort of elusive as the, the, the lynx are by reputation, didn't seem bothered by us at all. Not that we got, we were very respectful, but mm -hmm. didn't seem it wasn't like they darted off or anything, just kind of turned and looked at us and said, oh, you guys are here. Um, this is me, again, out in the middle of, I think, Russell Pond, and I just love uh, being able to see things from the middle of the pond, a view that you don't normally get. Sometimes, obviously, you do in a canoe, but um, winter in Baxter is great, and it feels very, very wild. Like, if you make a mistake, you could really pay for it. It's Back, oh. to, back to that lynx, and again, they, they let us get um, respectfully close, no, no, not uh, worried at all. Mm. Super, that's my idea of a charismatic megafauna. This is me and my supervisor, who figures high, a lot in the book, but this is obviously during COVID, and this is what rangers look like during COVID. Mm -hmm. And oh, back to Daisy Pond. That's basically my tale. Okay. I'm happy to answer all kinds of questions. No high pressure sales. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from Daisy Pond, what's your favorite place to go in the park? Um, I really like like Lily Pad Pond, which is a, a kidney pond, paddle yep. across kidney, hike down, um, and then paddle Lily Pad. That's one of my favorite trips. I love, uh, as I mentioned, I love double top. Yeah. Um, I love to be up in the Nasadahunk campground area. Um, Davis Pond is just mm -hmm. off the charts, beautiful. Yeah, I haven't been there yet, but I'm hoping to get a night over an overnight up there. Yeah, it's. I mean, this you can't go wrong pretty much anywhere. Any backcountry area yeah. is, is in the park is going to be just great. Yeah, Wasada Crook's my favorite. Wasada Crook Island. Yeah, that's a real great one. Great place. How Brook. Trail I love out of South Ranch. Yep. Um, you know, there's so many. Hard, hard to pick one. Yes. I've never climbed the mountain, only camped. But do people sign in and out so you know if they don't make it right. down? Mm -hmm. Well, they're <coughs> smart to. ones do. They're supposed, they're supposed to. to. Yeah, yeah, supposed I'm trying to remember from the book. We, I couldn't yeah. remember. We have a lot of people who think that. Um, like you'll read on forums on the internet that people think that we're trying to track them or something. We don't care where you are until mm -hmm. you don't come back. Right. Right. We're not going around reading um, <coughs> raw hiking rosters to find out where so and so is. Mm -hmm. um, if you're an AT hiker, you're doing something wrong, or if you're uh, if you don't show show <coughs> up at the end of the day, we'll do detective work and say, okay, I have this vehicle and this this the name on the vehicle, so I'll go over and see if it matches anything on the hiking roster, and then we'll talk to the folks. You know, the neighboring campgrounds. This is a vehicle I have. I don't. You know, so we do a lot of detective work at the end of the day, trying to match. <coughs> people to vehicles, basically. Um, we will, our, our policy has sort of evolved since I've been there. It was pretty quickly into my career, but we don't go up unless we know of an injury or someone's requesting help. So I, just the other day, I was at, it was at Daisy Pond, and somebody came up to me and said, I saw lights on the mountain last night. And I'm like, well, great. 
you know, oh, they, you know, we went up and tried to find you at 10 p.m. So I was probably asleep by then. Um, <laughs> but people stay up there all night long. And they have had lamps, and they usually show up by 10 in the morning. And they're fine. Um, and if we went up <laughs> after every set of head, headlamps that we saw, we would be up there every single night. Mm -hmm. So we just, unless we know there's an injury, unless a person is elderly, unless the weather is going to be really a dramatic change to the weather, so it's super, super cold, or lightning storm, or we'll just not wait it out. Um, a lot of people are surprised by that. But, but we do we do try to keep track of where people are so that we know that, oh, they never showed up last night. We need to go at 10 a.m. the next day. We'll start looking for them. <coughs> and they're almost always back safe. Yeah. Most people are smart enough to sit down and wait till the sun comes up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, other questions? Could yes. you tell the top of the day hike? Yes. That, the, everything in the park is a day hike. It's hiding the day hike. I mean, some people will go up to Chimney and so, you know, half the way up the mountain and, and make it a two day hike, but most people do it tied in the day. And double, hop, double top is small. So it's pretty, pretty okay. easy to get on. Other questions? My niece and her 10 year old son are spending this weekend up at Baxter for his birthday, and he is interested in becoming a park ranger someday, he thinks. Awesome. Do most people do a six month? Are there a lot of people who do six months on and then something else the in the winter? Yes, the majority of us are seasonal. Yeah. The park has a skeleton crew of about a dozen um, rangers, and, mm -hmm. then, and then, you know, we have maintenance staff, we have some people in the interpretive uh, department. And so we have a few other people, but for the most part, we're stocked by seasonals. And you, you can get us a year-round job. There have been several that have come up since I've been there, but it just never worked out with my yeah. life situation. And is it hard to do <coughs> ranger work if you have a family? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I have a family, and it was always very hard. My ex was never very happy that I was a park ranger. Um, the way I always looked at it, it's I, my schedule is three and a half days a week. Okay. So I would not see my people for three days a week for six months of the year or 26 weeks. So you do the math and 78 days. Um, and then if you take vacation time and the time that they come up to visit, I mean, it gets down into the 50 something, 60 days, which is a lot, but that means 10 months a year I'm yeah. home. Mm -hmm. So even though it seems like <laughs> there are wardens, there are cops, but you're, you're there are not there you're, you're not there week round living up there. No, three and a half days at a time, mm -hmm. for me anyway. Yeah. So what, yes. what are you working on for the writing project right now? Right now I am doing mostly stuff under other people's names. Oh. Oh. Ghost writing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have a project with my own name on it at the moment, actually. Um, I, I've been, there's a couple fiction ideas that I, that I want to work on. I, wrote three novels um, last year for somebody else's name, which was my first uh, book-length fiction. I've done short stories and things like that, but that was the first book-length fiction, and I want to do more of that. <coughs> Maybe you need to follow in Paul Dwan's footsteps, and now yes. a park ranger who <laughs> solves <laughs> mysteries. Yeah, um, I, I have, uh, I know Paul. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have um, two Park Ranger ideas, mm -hmm. neither of which are solving mysteries, but um, that, that I'm kind of excited about. Mm -hmm. But I, it's again, it's a time and money thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of his was set on Sebec Lake, you remember? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> yep. Are, are you are you allowed to say who you ghost wrote for or no? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the, the yeah. NDA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> big big names. <laughs> oh, big, big names. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's that is has been my um, the past couple of years. I've done a, a lot of ghostwriting. That's sort of how I make my living. So. I was going to ask you with COVID and everybody getting outside and out into the national parks, state parks, whatever. Do you see a lot more unprepared people? Oh yeah, we definitely do. Yeah. It's un un unprepared for, for climbing, but also just people that aren't familiar with Baxter Park. And we are unique 
which is one of the reasons I like to be there, mm -hmm. um, because we are wilderness first, mm -hmm. and, and human recreation a distant second. And there's a lot of people that have a hard time with that notion. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I, one of the things I hate to say, but one of the things I wish, I was gonna say that the governor got wrong, I, but I shouldn't say that, that I wish he did differently was, Baxter was a first state park, and um, then, then the rest of the state park came, state parks came along, and we are no longer part of the state. We've never been part of the state park system. Right. So <clears throat> technically, we are not a state park the way other state parks are state parks. We are yeah. our own identity. So I kind of wish it was Baxter Wilderness Park or Baxter Preserve or mm -hmm. some other name other than state park. Because what we see is newbies show up with the beer cooler and the radio, and they just don't understand that we're a hiker's park where nature comes first. Right. Leave no trace sort of is our philosophy. Um, so, <coughs> so, but we've seen more and more of that. Um, well, we've been supporting Katahdin Woods and Waters. Yeah. Are they contiguous yes. to the boundary? I yes. thought they were. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know if I can get back there. I don't know if I want it forward. If it, I can go really fast backwards. Don't get sick. <laughs> Try not to get sick. <laughs> Um, it's very confused. Pretty. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay. So, you can see here, I believe. No, you can't really. Sh doesn't show Woods and Waters, does it? Um, but yes, it is to our, uh, to our east, right on the border. Okay. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one. Um, that's kind of brought a lot of new folks to the area, too. Mm -hmm. Now there's no direct way to go from there into Baxter. <coughs> no, correct. Right. I mean, you could bushwhack, right? But there's right. no, but there's no, no uh, roadway or no trail. road or anything like that. No, nothing formal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that's been an interesting change since I started at the park is you can see the Debs down here, mm -hmm. Debs Kennet Lake Wilderness Area. Nature Conservancy owns almost everything to our west now, really? and. Nature Conservancy, Chewanke, all kinds of, um, basically what I'm saying, it's almost all in conservation now. And that to the, so it's now, I forget what they say, it's like a, it's almost a half million, three quarters of a million acres in the greater Baxter area that is now preserved for perpetuity, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, one of the ironies, though, is that it is, one of the reasons we see fewer moose is because there's no clear cuts, and moose love to graze mm -hmm. on the new growth. Right. So that is one one reason. That's so. That's why you say go to Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I just joke. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Mm -mm. And AT trails still. And you were having trouble with partiers on the summit. Is that still an ongoing issue? Um, it, it is an ongoing issue. Um, yes. <laughs> Let's politically we'll just leave it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we ask. We have. We, there's a bunch of new stickers that came out a few years ago that says that say. Um, I forget what it is. Save your party for later or something like that, and it shows the summit and a AT hiker. Um, but yes, we've been we've been working with um, the Appalachian Trail community mm -hmm. to try and change sort of the culture and get people real. Uh, ready for Baxter before they reach Baxter. Mm -hmm. um, because we are slightly different. Many places along the trail, you can camp wherever you feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, we have, people are like, you have so many rules. We don't have too many rules that are different than other places. But um, but we do ask that you don't party on the summit. You don't go, in, you don't hike in big groups. You, you're quiet, you're respectful. Um, and that you pay 10 bucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we get a lot of AT hikers who do not want to part with ten dollars. So <laughs> they get yeah. sometimes if you uh, put them in the back of your truck and you take them to the the border, you know, to the edge of the park and say skedaddle, they will come up with ten bucks. <laughs> um, yeah. Other questions? Are there are there a lot of arrests in the park, or we don't have too many arrests? Are there, are there a lot of fines though? We, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot, but okay. we do, we do, um, we certainly, we have law enforcement, um, 
and we do, you know, for speeding, for littering, for all kinds of different things. We do um, occasionally um, have problem boats. Um, people litter a heck of a lot, but it's usually we, we find it later when they're long gone, you know, that kind of thing. But um, we don't. We we have um, a fair number of people who don't have the reverential attitude that I had when I was 10 years old. My parents were like, this is a gift. So we treat it with respect. And uh, I always had sort of a rever reverential attitude toward the park, and we see a lot of folks that don't have that same attitude. Mm. Um, That's sad. But, but for the most part, it's, <coughs> it's, it's not too bad. Um, In your work, you've always just worked at Baxter? Correct, yeah. <laughs> yep, uh, as far as being a park ranger. Is there a big loon population on the on the ponds and the in the park? Loon? Loons. Yes. Yeah. I would say it's fairly healthy. Oh, good. Yeah. And we just had an incident at the lake where a 17 and 16 year old brothers on a jet ski were harassing a loon. Mm. Oh. Our fire chief's wife's wife saw it, ran out in the dock, screamed at them. They paid her no attention, but then called the game warden. He came out, and I wish they had been fined, mm. but let them the riot act. They just got. <laughs> But how cruel! How, yeah. how can you be that that age and think it's okay to try to run down a loon on a jet ski? I know. I don't. I don't quite get it. I was shocked at that. Mm -hmm. It's a nice family, so mm -hmm. I hope they've learned something. But yeah, uh, yeah that was shocking. Just ugh, unbelievable. Yeah, we see all kinds of stuff, but for the most part, people are, are pretty pretty good, pretty well behaved. When they do fly fishing, is it mostly catch and release, or are they really? You are allowed to take two fish. Okay. Um, most people, I would say, don't keep two fish. Yeah. Um, so I would say <coughs> probably we see mostly catch and release, right. but I, I, I do know fishermen that take them and eat them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <coughs> and Casey fly only. Yeah. 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 Okay. In fact, all of the all of the. Um, the ponds and streams on the Nasadahunk watershed are fly fishing only. Yep. Grassy, uh, which is over here, and Elbow and Tracy, which are part of the Catawba Stream watershed, are, are general law. But yep. most, in my neighborhood, it's mostly fly fishing only. Mm -hmm. Yep. Beautiful. Other questions? No, no, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do have books over here if anybody wants one. Oh, sure.